Bohemian Rhapsody was one of the most anticipated films of 2018 and it shows great potential of receiving multiple nominations for the Academy Awards. Its focus is the revolutionary band Queen and especially their frontman Freddie Mercury. One of the many aspects that made this motion picture stand out was its cinematography, and visionary director of photography Newton Thomas Siegel is to be thanked for the beautiful imagery. This comes as no surprise considering his widely acclaimed work on Drive. Tom Siegel's camera of choice was the Arri Alexa, namely the 6K model, which emulates the golden age of 65mm widescreen filmmaking in the mid 20th century, when this newly introduced format captured the imagination of cinema audiences around the world, in conjunction with Prime DNA and 65S lenses. Siegel aimed for a golden vibrant look that became increasingly desaturated throughout the film, to synchronize with the time period and its respective color palette. In this video essay I will be analyzing the camera work, lighting, design and sound in the following sequence from Bohemian Rhapsody, which depicts an important part of the production of the famous eponymous song. The purpose of the scene is to show the tedious process and the growing frustration of Roger Taylor recording his part of the backing vocals. It goes back and forth between him and the booth where the rest of the band is listening from. Higher. Can you go a bit higher? If I go any higher, only dogs will hear me. Try. Higher. Jesus, how many more Galileos do you want? Very, very one more, one more. Galileo! One more. Galileo! 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 Again. Go on, roll the track. Galileo! Who even is Galileo? Galileo! The clip opens with a mid shot of Freddie Mercury looking to camera right. The field of view and minimal distortion in a cramped space indicate the use of a 35mm lens. This is repeated in the scene, so let's look at this last iteration when there is movement involved as well. The actor is lit from three points, the camera is below, but this time with a subtle jib up move to symbolize how Roger's singing is growing on Freddy. His red top brings him out in this frame with rather muted beige tones. The low angle also helps to make use of the leading lines in the ceiling to point towards the actor who's placed in the center of the frame. The spotlights justify the subtle rim light which separates his brown hair from the dark ceiling. Judging by the light on his face, the key is very diffused, almost perpendicular on the actor from the right of frame. In the next shot showing the entire room, a lamp justifies the feel on his face. This is a very well balanced frame, perhaps taken at 28mm, which is the widest DNA prime. The five characters are strategically placed so that they don't overlap with each other and they only take up the necessary space. There are four lamps in shot and we also know there are spotlights in the ceiling, Freddy's hair light, but the key is most probably a large soft light shining from behind the camera at a 45 degree angle from the left. On the producers and John's faces the contrast is really subtle and the only noticeable shadow on the back wall is the lamp's shade generated by itself. We also know they are only separated by glass from the recording space where there's a lot of natural light. The practical next to John motivates him having the best lit face and hair creating some separation from the background too. Because of this, his bright shirt and Freddy's red top mentioned earlier, the viewer's eyes are more drawn towards the left side of the frame. The cinematographer cleverly directed this so that we pay attention to the character delivering the line. The lamp on the right at the back has a warmer color temperature and separates both these characters from the wall by making it brighter than their clothing and hair. Having the camera placed in Roger's perspective makes this shot great because it also establishes the geography of each character in relationship to the others and therefore motivates where everyone is looking in their individual close-ups. If I go any higher, only dogs will hear me. Roger's response comes in as an L cut to a mid-shot which is used multiple times in the scene. In this case the camera is still but later a dolly in brings the audience closer to the character and then the camera is pushed back motivated by Roger's hand movement. The framing is rather unconventional with him and these panels being just slightly off-center. However, if we look at the ceiling and the rest of the room it does seem symmetrical. A viable explanation would be that actual sunlight was used and they had to position the actor so that the light would land on him at the desired angle. Speaking of which, daylight is the main source in this shot and we can see the rays coming in through the window. It also bounces off these panels and acts as a fill, slightly bringing up the shadows on the actor's face. The light appears to have an angelic glow on his face which goes hand in hand with his high voice. In this shot the camera is placed at a high angle. 
The frame is asymmetrical because the purpose of the shot is to show Roger's reflections in the transparent panels. Therefore, the image correlates with the audio emulating the choir effect in a visual way with these clones. This wide shows the sunbeams in all their glory thanks to the haze that creates depth and shapes the light with the aid of the window frames. There are also two hanging lights in the background, perhaps to add interest, as they aren't affecting the subject in any way. On the very left of frame we can see the corner of a piano in the foreground adding more depth. Interestingly enough, there is some colored light shining on it, perhaps coming from the daylight through a stained window. Like Freddy, Roger is prominent in the frame because of the color contrast between his blue jacket and the warm hues of the room. The perspective matches the frontality of the earlier wide of the booth. The deep focus and the 240 to 1 aspect ratio also complement this shot. The lack of depth of field and additional frame width allow useful elements of set design like the musical instruments and gear in the background to offer more context. The reason we only get these wide shots so late in the sequence is to show how Roger steps out of what he was doing and therefore distances himself from the lyrics by questioning their meaning. Hence, this break in the pace emphasizes the delivery of his line which would otherwise be less noticeable because of the overlapping layers of sound. Who even is Galileo? This extreme close-up of Roger's mouth and the microphone silhouetted generated visual interest through the amplified contrast standing out from the other shots in the sequence. This was captured on a fairly wide lens, less common for close-ups because of the distortion. The audio is cleverly used as an L cut to match the perspectives of the characters. Jesus, how many more Galileos do you want? When we see Brian May, Roger's voice is muffled and when we see him it sounds clear. Speaking of whom, these mid-shots of Brian and John and the producer show the involvement of the entire band against Roger. These framings are useful at establishing the dialogue between them following the cinematic conventions of looking room and the 180 degree rule. There is also a quick focus rack to highlight both actors' performances in this shot. The close-ups of the recording equipment highlight the convincing set replica of the house where Queen recorded their album. Alongside these shots, the button presses and the tape whirring exaggerate the realism of a diegetic soundscape. Here you go. Go! Okay. One more. I get In contrast, numerous layers of Roger's recordings and the backing vocals overlap towards the end of the sequence and make the audio overwhelming and slightly distressing. Not only that, but we can hear more indications coming from the booth. I get it. Go on, roll the track. The final shot of the sequence is even and symmetric as far as both framing and lighting go. Its purpose is to show the sheer amount of audio tracks being used to record a song and the meters are in sync with the sound. This is also a perfect example to show the characteristics of an anamorphic lens, the curvature in the lines that are normally straight and the corners that are blurred while the center is still in focus. Conclusively, the elements of cinematography and mise-en-scene are skillfully employed in a shown clip to successfully convey meaning and trigger the audience's emotional responses. The fast pace and variety of shots, in conjunction with a cluttered set and staggering soundscape, embody the filmmaking craft that forces the viewers to relate to the characters' feelings of frustration and fatigue, despite the soft cinematic look and pleasing color palette that suggests a warm and comforting environment. Are we done? That's it. He loves you. So you think you can stop me? Spinning my